Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome everyone to the second lecture of Atoms to Materials. Uh, today uh, we're going to start talking about quantum mechanics and hopefully start developing an intuition for how quantum mechanics works. And uh, we're going to start by motivating why we need quantum mechanics. And uh, we're going to use an example. We're going to start with the simplest possible atom, okay? And we're going to start our road of connecting atoms to materials. So the, the simplest atom is, of course, hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is made, uh, it consists of a proton and an electron, okay? The uh, proton has charge plus E, okay? And the electron has charge negative E, so of course the uh, atom is neutral. And the proton is significantly more massive than the electron, okay? The proton, the mass of the proton is about 2,000 times uh, larger than that of the electron. So we're going to assume that the proton is standing still at the origin, it's not moving, and the electron is around it, okay? And I'm going to worry about uh, the position uh, of the electron. And what we're going to, to do is describe the hydrogen atom, try to describe it using classical mechanics, okay? So in classical mechanics, the state of a system is given at a, at a given time by its position and its velocity, okay? So if I know the position and the velocity of the electron, then I know everything about my system. Remember we said that the proton is, proton is standing still. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write an expression for the total energy of this system. And as you all know, the equilibrium configuration of the atom would be the configuration with the lowest energy, okay? So we know that in materials and in, in nature in general, uh, systems try to minimize their energy, right? That's why if I drop this pen, it's going to fall uh, to the table. Uh, uh, that's minimizing its energy pulled by uh, gravity. So let's do that. Uh, there's two terms of uh, the, the total energy of a system. Uh, there is a, a potential energy. And uh, in this case, in the case of hydrogen, the potential energy is uh, dominated by the by electrostatics uh, interactions, by Coulomb uh, interaction. And the total energy uh, depends on the separation distance between the proton and the electron. And it's written in this, this form. This is Coulomb's law. It's the, uh, the total energy is the charge of one particle times the charge of the other particle divided by the separation distance. So the energy uh, goes down uh, the magnitude of the energy okay, uh, decreases as you move away uh, from each other. Now, in our case, the charge of the proton is plus E, the charge of the electron is negative E, so the energy has this form, negative E squared over R, okay, over the separation distance. If we plot this potential energy as a function of distance between these two, what we see is that the potential energy go, becomes more and more negative as I bring these two atoms together, okay? That means that the electron is pulled by the proton, okay? The energy goes down as we bring them together. So that's potential energy, Coulomb interaction. You may remember that the Coulomb force is uh, one over distance squared, okay? Uh, the force is the, the gradient of the energy, it's negative the gradient of the energy, so uh, energy w goes with one over R, force, it's the derivative, goes with uh, one over R squared, okay? Uh, that's one component of the energy, potential energy. This has to do with the interaction between the two particles. The other component is kinetic energy, okay? It's the energy associated with the motion of the electron. And uh, all of you uh, would know that the kinetic energy of a, a moving particle is one half times its mass times V squared, okay? One half MV squared. And we're going to write that in a slightly different way in terms of the linear momentum, okay? The linear momentum is mass times velocity. It's typically called P, okay? And uh, so uh, the kinetic energy can be written as P squared over 2M, okay? It's the same expression. All right, so that's great. We have an expression for the potential and the total and the 
kinetic energy. If we add them up, we get the total energy. And now what I'm going to do is try to minimize this energy. Okay, so uh, let's call P is going to be, uh, the kinetic energy is going to be K. Okay, so minimizing K. Okay, of course the, the kinetic energy is P squared, so it has to be positive or zero, cannot be negative. So the smallest possible kinetic energy is P equals zero. Okay, so zero velocity. That means the electron is not moving at all. That's great. The second term, potential energy, we're going to call it V. So minimizing V, the lowest possible value that this expression can have is negative infinity when the position is zero. Okay? So that means that the classical solution predicts that the electron is going to collapse into the proton and it's not going to be moving there. Okay? So uh, that, that's very bad news. Okay? That tells us that with classical mechanics, would predict that the atom collapses into a point, it has negative infinity energy. It's not a good description. Okay, well, of course we know that the that atoms have finite size and they have finite energies, okay? And, and so this clearly shows a shortcoming of uh, classical mechanics, uh, that it's just unable to describe these uh, electron, uh, electronic or atomic physics. So let's switch to quantum mechanics. And, uh, and we're going to try to solve the hydrogen atom using quantum mechanics, and we're going to learn the basic principles of quantum mechanics along the way. So quantum mechanics tells you, well, forget about knowing the position and the velocity of a particle independently. These two quantities are not completely independent. They're related to one another. And quantum mechanics tells you the state of a system at a given time is fully determined by its wave function, okay? Uh, so the wave function is a function of space, psi of r, uh, and I'm going to just sketch it here, sketch a possible shape of the function as a function of position, of the wave function as a function of position. And we're going to see in a minute that the wave function more or less tells you where the electron is, okay? So if the wave function is zero, that means the, the electron is not there. And we probably all have some familiarity with quantum mechanics. We all know that uh, uh, you know, electrons are described as a cloud okay, of probability. And, and the, the wave function tells you it's associated with that probability. Okay? So uh, again, you cannot know the position and the velocity uh, independently. All the information, as we will see in a minute, is in the wave function. Okay? Great. So the second thing that we need to learn about quantum mechanics is that any physical observable, anything that you can measure physically, is associated with an operator, okay? A mathematical operator. So uh, operators are mathematical objects that act on functions. They're not functions, they're not numbers. They're objects that act on functions. And specifically in quantum mechanics, we're going to, the operators are going to act on wave functions, okay? And there's two operators, uh, only two, that we'll have to learn. Uh, one is the operator position, okay? And the operator position is very simple. It says multiply times r, okay? Take the wave function and multiply it times r. Simple enough. Uh, in a minute, we're going to do some examples of how we use operators to make predictions. The second operator that we need to worry about is the operator for momentum, okay? And uh, the operator for momentum uh, is proportional to the gradient of the wave function, okay? So uh, the, it has two prefactors, h bar here at the top. Uh, h bar is Planck's constant, and uh, I here is uh, the imaginary unit, okay? So the square root of negative one. Uh, and then, so it's those two, that's just a constant prefactor times the gradient operator. The gradient operator, what you see on the right explicitly, it's uh, typically described by this letter called nabla. Uh, this operator 
is a vector. It has components along x, y, and z. The component along x is the derivative with respect to x. The component along y is the derivative with respect to y. And the component along z is the derivative with respect to z. Okay? And as we said, it's not a function. It's something that can act on a function. If we put a function there. You take derivatives of that particular function. So two things that are important. Uh, remember, momentum, like velocity, is a vector. So the operator is also a vector. And interestingly, you can see here how uh, uh, the, the, the simple, the same wave function will be able to tell us about position and momentum, has the information about position and velocity, because we're going to use an operator acting on the same wave function to learn about position and momentum. So uh, last uh, piece of uh, background information to before we go back to hydrogen. Uh, when we measure things in the lab, okay, what uh, comes out is a number. Okay, it's not a function, it's not a, an operator. Okay, if I measure an energy, I get a, a number. Okay, 13.6 electron volts. If I measure a distance, I get something in nanometers or in angstroms. And in quantum mechanics, things that you measure in the lab are associated with uh, a mathematical operation called the expectation value of an operator. Okay, so operator, o operators are associated with physical observables, things that I can measure. It is the expectation value of that operator what I measure in the lab. Okay, so what you see here uh, in this equation is the definition of the expectation value of a generic operator O. Okay, and uh, the way it's done uh, is it's an integral over all of space of the wave function uh, psi. The operator acting on the wave function it has on the right, okay? Operator acting on the function. And then the result multiplied again by the function, okay? And uh, if we want to be mathematically more rigorous, the second function is actually the complex conjugate, but we're not going to worry about uh, those details for the, for the most part. So again, what I measure in the lab is the expectation value of the operator that I'm interested in, which is an average over all of space of the involving the wave function and the operator. Okay, great. Uh, as we go, uh, I know this is a lot. If, if this is your first time learning about quantum mechanics, this is going to look counterintuitive now. Uh, we'll do work on, on various examples throughout the lectures, and I think uh, this uh, will make a lot of sense very soon. Okay, so let's do an example. Okay, so let's say I want to calculate the expectation value of the operator position. Okay, I go to the lab, I measure the position of the electron, and I want to do a mathematical calculation that will show me the position. So as we said, it's an expectation value that I need to uh, calculate. I have the wave function multiply the operator acting on the wave function. The operator position is simply multiply times r, and then the wave function again. So in this particular case, I can move things around, and I have an integral over of r, the position, times the wave function squared integrated over all of space. Okay, And uh, a note on nomenclature, I'm going to use this d3r to indicate dx times dy times dz integrating over all of space. All right, so this expectation value of position, or the average position of the electron, uh, is a way to think about it, is an integral over all of space of the possible position times the wave function square. Okay, And if you remember the definition of probabilities, what you will uh, and realize is that the wave function squared is the probability density of finding the electron at position r. Uh, what that means is that the average position is uh, a sum over all possible positions of the value of that possible position times the probability of that position actually being the location of the electron. Okay, So the wave function squared, this is very important, it gives us an interpretation for the wave function. The wave function squared, which will guarantee that it's positive, um, 
is the probability density of finding the electron around position R. Okay. All right. Now we're going to go back to hydrogen. Okay. And I'm going to do the same thing in quantum mechanics that I did classically in classical mechanics. I'm going to write the expectation value for the energy and I'm going to try to minimize the energy with respect to the state of the system. In this case, try to think about what wave function will minimize the energy in the same way classically we did, we found what position and velocity would minimize the energy. Okay, So for energy I'm going to do to, to know what the expectation value for the energy will be. Uh, I'm going to do this expression that you see at the top. Uh, it's the expectation value of an operator, okay? And this is an operator for total energy of the system. And this operator is called the Hamiltonian. And uh, we're going to learn quite a bit uh, more about the Hamiltonian in the coming lectures. But as in classical mechanics, it has two components. It has a potential energy, E squared over uh, R, same as in classical mechanics, and it has a kinetic energy term. Okay, That's, as in classical mechanics, P squared over 2M. Remember, the operator P, momentum, had to do with the gradient, so the kinetic energy has to do with the gradient squared, which is this operator here, the Navla square operator. Okay, so what I'm doing here on the right hand side of the equation is just writing out the kinetic energy, the expectation value for the kinetic energy, and the expectation value for the potential energy. Okay, so as before, as we did in classical mechanics, we're going to try to minimize uh, these two expressions. Okay, so what type of wave function? will give me low kinetic energy and low potential energy. So let's start with minimizing the kinetic energy, okay? And then we're going to think about potential energy. So what do I want for the to minimize the kinetic energy? If we look at the expression, we see that the kinetic energy has to do with gradients of the wave function, with how fast or how slow the wave function is changing. So to minimize the wave fun the kinetic energy, what I want is a smooth wave functions. Smooth wave functions. Small gradients. Okay, great. So if the wave function has small gradient, it's going to have small you know, lower momentum and smaller kinetic energy. Um, for the potential energy, what I want to do, let's look at the expression over here. What I need to do is, the expression is wave function squared over R. So I want uh, wave function squared to be large for small r's. Right? And this means I want the wave function squared, that's the probability of finding the electron at position r, to be very large for small r. That means that the electron spends a lot of time, the probability of finding the electron very close to the proton is very high. That's exactly like in classical mechanics. So uh, keeping these two things in mind, we're going to explore different shapes of wave functions and try to find what will be the best possible wave function for hydrogen. Let's start here on the right. Uh, what you see here, uh, well, in, in all of these three plots, you see the potential energy at the bottom. This is the one, one over R uh, Coulomb energy, okay, in black, and three possible wave functions in red. The wave function on the right is a very compact wave function where the electron is confined to spending a lot of time near the proton and it cannot wander away, uh, 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 far away from the proton very much. Okay, so this wave function will have a very low potential energy. That's very good. The potential energy, remember, to minimize the potential energy, we wanted the electron to spend a lot of time next to the proton. However, the kinetic energy is going to be very high 
because kinetic energy has to do with gradients of the wave function. Okay? And so this wave function will have gigantic gradients. So the kinetic energy is really, really bad. Now let's go to the other extreme on the left. Here I have a very um, uh, uh, diffuse wave function. So the electron can spend a lot of time moving away from the proton, being far away from the proton. So here the kinetic energy uh, will be great, will be very low, because I have very small gradients. However, the potential energy will be high. Okay? And it will be high because the electron spends a lot of time far away from the proton where the potential energy is not so great. Right? The potential energy here is not very good. Uh, over here, the potential energy is very high, very low, so very good. Uh, so between these two extremes, there's a happy medium. Okay? There's an optimal solution. And this optimal solution uh, that we're going to work in the next few lectures in detail uh, tells us that quantum mechanics predicts a finite size atom. Okay, uh, quantum mechanics is able to stabilize the atom as opposed to collapsing it like quant like classical mechanics does, and, and we've had success. Okay, so. With a few concepts uh, that, that uh, we talked about today and that will continue developing in the next few lectures, we have been able to explain the finite size and finite energy of the hydrogen atom and hopefully start to develop an intuition as to how quantum mechanics works. Let me make one, th one more comment, which is that it's really the kinetic energy that saves the day, okay? As I, if my hands are the wave function, okay, as I try to make the wave function more and more compact, the kinetic energy is going up because the gradients of the wave functions are increasing. And, uh, and that's bad, right? So at one point, there's going to find, even though the potential energy wants to make the wave function very compact, the kinetic energy wants to keep it spread out. And they, they, there's a, a balance between these two and a, 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 a compromise is reached. Uh, for a finite size. So we can relate this to a principle that we all heard uh, about, which is called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And, uh, and, and this will hopefully give us a, an intuitive understanding of kinetic energy in quantum mechanics. Heisenberg says that you cannot know both position and velocity with infinite accuracy. Okay, That's a fundamental aspect of quantum mechanics. And so in this uncertain principle, it goes a little bit further. And it tells you that the more you know about the position of a particle, the less you know about its velocity. So as I try to make the hydrogen atom more and more compact, as I try to collapse the wave function into a point, I am knowing more and more about the position of where that electron is. I'm confining the electron more and more. As I confine the electron more and more, and I know more about its position, I'll have more uncertainties about its velocity. So that means that the probability of having a very large velocity increases, and the kinetic energy uh, will also increase. So it's really the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the kinetic energy that stops the hydrogen atom from collapsing stabilizes it and allows us to uh, uh, will allow us to start from hydrogen and build our way up to molecules and materials and crystals. Okay. So let's sum up uh, in in a minute uh, what we learned in this lecture. In classical mechanics, the state of the system is position and momentum. They're independently known variables. We wrote the kinetic energy and the potential energy, and we found that the minimum energy was negative infinity and that the atom really collapsed into a point, which is not a, a very good uh, result. Uh, fortunately, quantum mechanics uh, uh, saves the day, and uh, it tells us that, well, Forget about uh, knowing position and velocity. The wave function of the system has all the information you know, both about position and velocity. Uh, we have been able to write an expression for the total energy, that's kinetic plus potential. It's called the Hamiltonian operator. And uh, we found that um, the ground state, uh, the lowest energy state of hydrogen, has a finite size. 
it doesn't collapse, and really quantum mechanics saves the day. And uh, this all thanks to the kinetic energy. Okay, so we have to thank uh, the kinetic energy and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, for stabilizing our atoms from which we can build molecules, materials, and people. Thank you very much. I'll see you in lecture three.